Hello and welcome to Stories, the True and the Fictional, the variety show that revolves around one central theme, stories and the people that tell them. If you haven't done so already, hit subscribe and ring that notification bell. And hey, if you're feeling up for it, leave a comment down below, let us know you subscribe and we will give you a shout out. We here at Stories the True and the Fictional love giving shout outs to authors, both seasoned and new. Today we're giving a special shout out to author Ashley Reverie from Northern England. Almost Human Discovery is a dystopian sci-fi following a genetically modified human who escapes the lab. The book takes a deep look at what makes us human and focuses on emotion, but without the romance. Grab a copy of Almost Human Discovery on Amazon by following the link in the show notes. Hello and welcome guys to this episode of Stories, the True and the Fictional. Today we have Martin Kearns. I said that right. You did hesitate, you right. even though we just had a whole conversation about it, Jamie. <laughs> don't don't spoil the uh the, the magic oh, behind the scenes magic. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> how you going, Martin? It's going well. Thanks, guys, for having me on. You're very welcome, mate. Thank you for taking the time to come on. What time is it over there in, in your neck of the woods? It's uh eight fifteen by the clock and about two in the morning by my body right now. Okay, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll I'll match that. It's ten fourteen a.m. over here and about two a.m. in my body at the moment. So. You know, we, you should feel, feel, feel very pleasured that I, I got up and had a shower and, and got ready for this this early on a Saturday morning when I could just be sitting behind the PS5. So, <laughs> yeah, I do feel honored. <laughs> I do feel honored, actually, because the PS5, there's a siren's call right there. Uh, it's well, tough to put that thing down. Considering I had to wait 18 months for mine, I'm, 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 I've had it for about, I think, six months now, and I'm still not getting, you know, I haven't gotten to the bottom of everything quite yet so oh. yeah you're but, gonna hate me for this little thing but i've had two purchased now the first one i did have to resell to somebody i knew not yeah. for much of a profit but I, I had to pay some medical bills we'll circle back to that topic later and then the <laughs> second one i got uh and i, I immediately turnkeyed it to my buddy who's got a 4k tv and the whole setup and he's been dying to get one so i felt kind of bad Shot no, that's a, that's an. I'm not going to hate you for that. That's a nice, generous thing that you you did. You know, I, I can I can get behind that 100. percent There's not enough. My 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 only gripe is the people that were getting on and buying a hundred and then just yeah. selling for triple the price. Yeah, it's brutal. So, you know, I I had to pay a little bit more for mine, not as much as those guys were selling them for on the internet, but only only a hundred dollars more, which I'm I'm happy with. Um, but no, that was a very nice thing to do. So no hatred there at all. There we go. Well, I call it kind of like a hero. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know if Derek feels like I'm a hero, but I'm going to tell him he should. Yeah, you should because, and then you can always <laughs> say, "Look, man, how much do you love that PS5? I'll take it back if you don't think I'm a hero." Well, he's been enjoying it. We've been playing Elden Ring on it like no. crazy, um, and the co-op on that is just endlessly good. So. I'm, I'm scared of that game. <laughs> I, it's it my be. kind of game, my kind of game. But our friend Chris. Uh, put me on to um, Dark Souls a long, long time ago, and I, I, I can't deal with that. It's too hard. And he said, well, Elden Ring is kind of like the new Dark Souls because it's insanely hard. So yeah. I'm, I'm a gamer, but I'm, I, can't, I can't take that kind of pressure in my life right now. <laughs> this one gives you a lot of outs. I'll leave it like okay. kind of at that. There's a lot of different ways you can make the game much more forgiving, and it mm -hmm. takes a lot of that edge off. I did appreciate the original Dark Souls for how damn hard it was. I think mm -hmm. that's the first time I threw a controller through the wall yep. or into the wall, where like mm -hmm. stuck in the wall. Smog and Ornstein, if anybody's familiar. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> um, I agree with you because I did the same thing. And but the thing is, I only did it about a year ago because I only played it for the first time a year ago, so I have no defense. I threw. A controller almost threw my TV at 39 years old. So, yeah. Oof. Luckily, That's I had tough. to restraint and sort of curved it, and it went to the wall <laughs> of the TV. But yeah. See, as a kid, I had bean bags set up so I could <laughs> throw the controller. That's a smart move. Yeah. yeah, it's that's a good setup right there. All right. Well, let's crack into our icebreaker questions. We like to do this with all of our authors, so we get give our viewers and listeners a chance to get to know. The real you uh, and what you would do in some crazy, crazy situation. So okay. I'll take the first one. 
because in my contract, I always get the third and fifth question. So um, <laughs> that's how I'm going to start it. So <laughs> Martin, if you could get rid of one thing in the world, what would it be? And I'm going to preference this because I should do this more with people. You don't have to, to like to do the answer that will make everyone go, oh, you can say whatever you want. If you don't like pickles, you can bugger them off. If, just be honest and tell us what you want to get rid of. So I don't have to cure cancer? No, no, you can. No, look, All right. look that's going to get cured anyway, <laughs> eventually. You can just be selfish. This is a question I like to say, be selfish. Yeah. All right. I think I'm going to divide the room a little bit on this one, but I don't care. Um, I would abolish mayonnaise. I think yeah, I would get I rid of mayo it. entirely. Yeah. Cannot stand it. Cannot stand it. I don't yeah. like that they've they've Trojan horse that crap and everything and call yep. it a Yoli. Yep. And yep, we're good. I remember driving uh, 25 minutes back to a Wendy's once after ordering a burger, and I was like, "What is this? Why mm -hmm. would you put mayonnaise on a hamburger?" Apparently, it's big in Canada. Which is fine for them. <laughs> they're, too, they're, too, they're too polite in Canada to say anything. So, you know, oh, I don't, I don't like mayonnaise. I'm allergic to it. It'll kill me. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Just enjoy. Yeah. But no, I, I've hated mayonnaise forever, and it's on everything. And I just, yep. uh, no, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm getting rid of mayo. And I'm, I hate I'm, the extra effort I have to go to when ordering a burger and saying no mayo. <laughs> the easiest way, and the easiest way to not get it, and this is something that I've found over the years because I'm with you. I hate mayonnaise. I do. White creamy stuff should not be on a burger. Okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I, so, so what I do is I just say if I'm ordering Uber Eats or if I'm in a restaurant or whatever, I just say I'm allergic to mayonnaise. And then that there cannot be a single <laughs> particle of mayonnaise on the burger or on whatever I'm having. Because even they do it on toasted sandwiches now. And yeah. I just say I'm allergic to mayonnaise and then I never get mayonnaise. Yeah. Because yeah. they're too, too afraid that I'm going to sue them. Exactly. And that puts them liable. And then you've won. You've just made like, this is 3D chess and you're the winner right now. Exactly. So if you're free to use that, that guy, it works yeah. every damn time. I'm gonna, I mean, I would settle for maybe even just banning aioli because that's where my problem comes in. I ordered, uh, we went out to dinner for the first time in three years. Thank you. Yeah. Pandemic. And, and, <laughs> you know, kids and, mm -hmm. um, and I remember ordering two things off the menu. It didn't even say it came with aioli and the guy, came over dropped it and i was just like hey i hate to be that guy but what is that he's like oh that's our kicking freaking aioli sauce and i was like yeah that's mayonnaise you're gonna have to go ahead and not, <laughs> not have mayonnaise on this yeah. and he looked so crushed and i was like oh i'm sorry i'm sorry no look and and there are like there's, there's a percentage of the population uh who absolutely love aioli and garlic aioli and pickle nays and all that rubbish mm -hmm. and they're but, wrong yeah and they're wrong <laughs> thank you jamie that was my answer so um, yeah, no, look, you're, we're on board with that. We'll jump on your political campaign straight away for no mayonnaise. No, no, uh, no division there, mate. None at all. Uh. <laughs> all right, so your question, tell, Jamie? Tell us something so that is on your bucket list. And also, sorry to interrupt you there, you don't have to say visiting Australia because a lot of people think they have to say visiting Australia <laughs> to visit. We don't like it here. We don't like everything that here. So, you know, just say what you can say, whatever you want. <laughs> I really do want to visit Australia. I have a friend who moved to uh, Melbourne. Uh, gosh, I probably pronounced that wrong. No, no, um, you're better than most people. Okay, I'll take it. Um, gosh, he's been there 12 years now. Oh, well. It feels like and forever. And he's still alive? <laughs> he's still alive. All the, I mean, he's shown me some pictures of the spiders and I was like, enjoy that, bud. Um, but he has like six kids now too. He's living wow. the dream down there. He loves it. He loves Australia too. He's just head well, over we, heels we call, for it and his Australian our wife. Melbournians. They're, they're the Mexicans of, um, of Australia. <laughs> we live in New South Wales, uh, which okay. is the best, the best state in the world. And um, okay. yeah, so yeah, the, 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 there's only one good thing that ever came out of Melbourne and that's the Hume Highway North New South Wales. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sure your friend's a lovely guy and we wish him all the best, but. I'm going to tell him to move. Yeah, tell him to move to New South Wales. Well, if, if the last two years didn't convince him to move. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because apparently, um, I think it was. Hold on, hold one, on. We need one year, they... Jamie's political statement. No, just... Jamie's political statement. <laughs> I'm just saying in the, in the last year, 50,000 people migrated from Melbourne to yep. Queensland. Oh, really? So, I've heard good things about Queensland. I saw a Netflix show too, where they had a house over there and the place is beautiful. It's, it's yeah. just, but, it's just, that's where all the crocodiles are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, see, the that's what I want to go, avoid. The more north you go, so you go, 
uh, northern Queensland across to the Northern Territory, that's where the big mm. boys are. That's where the big yeah. are. The... It's all, it, where all the bad snakes are as well. Yeah. Yeah, the salties. Um, my friend did a Knowles course, and he was in the bush for six months mm -hmm. in a canoe out there with the with the crocodiles, oh, and yeah. he saw some stuff. He met some um, Aborigines too. Mm -hmm. um, or is it Aboriginals? Yeah, no, no, you're right, spot on the right. They're, they're, okay, they're, they're, multiple they're, terms. I think the, the they they are Aboriginal, but they are Aborigines as the people. So, yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. So he met a few of them and they brought him out to a big pool and they pointed at a big old shadow sitting in the middle of it. And he was mm -hmm. like, it was a dinosaur. Yeah. <laughs> that yep. thing was enormous. Yep. Now, if you ever, if you're ever interested, there's a, there's a movie. It's not a, it's not a documentary. It is a movie and it's a little bit embellished. It's called Rogue. Uh, it's mm -hmm. got, um, that's, that's about one of the, it's based on a true story of one of the largest crocodiles that has ever been found in the Northern Territory. And it's, it's a big boy. It's it's prehistoric style, so very good if you're interested. Rogue documentary style, or is it a like a B horror? No, film? no, it's a, yeah, it's like a B horror movie. It's got some of Australia's biggest cast, but um, you know that doesn't say much. Um, but it's um, yeah, it's really good. Check it out. It's called Rogue. Okay. Um, it's probably on Prime or something like that. Um, yeah, and that's the I spot. It it's uh, I love crocodile. Yeah, I it's... love. I'm I'm a massive horror buff, so I love my horror. So um. It was really good. I, I, I like to watch a lot of horror stuff that comes out of Australia because not very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that was and it's very Australian. It really <laughs> very is. Australian. It like really the Foster's is. commercials. <laughs> They're really uh, rubbing by it on the way, there. By the way, Martin, we don't drink Foster's. Just to give <laughs> you a heads I've up. Heard. It's, it's, it's like I used to drink, I don't drink anymore. But when I did, it's I, I uh, we me and Jamie used to be in bands, right? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes there'd be bands that'd come from overseas and they'd be like, oh, Foster's. And I'm like, no, nah, mate, don't drink that shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's, it's like people think we only drink Budweiser in America. Exactly. Yeah, it's but, the same but, double standard like, sort of thing. Right, though, that's all you drink, Budweiser? Yeah, or no, actually, Bud Light. Oh, excellent. Cool. Is, the, is the big one because we got to watch our calories. <laughs> <laughs> Get the Big Mac and the king size fries and the Bud Light. Oh, yeah. I think <laughs> we actually stuff. veered away from the question. So, what is actually on your sorry, Mark. Oh, sorry <laughs> about that. Um, <laughs> this one was actually one of the few serious ones that came to mind because I couldn't like think of a funny thing I wanted to say more than I wanted to say this. I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Cormac McCarthy. No. Um, no, author of No Country for Old Men. If you've oh, seen yeah, it. yes, I've seen the movie. Um, he's the author of my favorite book, which is Blood Meridian, too. That that novel. It's a bit of a. I mean, you're gonna see some stuff when you read that thing, but um, man, is it a gut punch of a book? And he's just one of the. He's probably the greatest living writer, I think. Okay. Um, he's got. He doesn't use grammar or like punctuation really in his sentences either, and I would just love to figure out how he pulled that off just refuses to do it and so he doesn't <laughs> and it still works and he's just absolutely brilliant and i just maybe bucket list like four hours with him and maybe a couple of espressos or something like that and to hear what he has to say about various things see i think that's a i think that's a really good bucket list um because obviously being a writer yourself that ties into your passion and and as, mm. as i know like i'm not a writer maybe one day but i know from being friends with jamie you've got to be passionate if you want to be a good writer and mm -hmm. you know, for you to sort of turn your bucket list into something, look, I want to spend four hours with this guy. I want to pick his brain. I want to find out all about his writing style. It's, it's just, I think that's a perfect thing because essentially that's what your bucket list is supposed to be. It's supposed to do something that you want to do before you die. That's going to further your life. And I think that's mm -hmm. a really good answer. I got to get there soon though. I think he's getting, he's getting up there. Uh, well, <laughs> Is this a good time to announce our next guest? It, no. <laughs> oh, wow. That would be amazing. No, he wouldn't come on. <laughs> no, no, he, 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 he wasn't sure. He, he's just like, look, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to overshadow Martin Kern. So I'm just going to sit back and hang back. Yeah. But, um, I appreciate that. If you had actually that, logged on, if you had logged on a little, like uh, maybe a couple of minutes earlier, we did actually have Keanu Reeves in. Oh, that um, would be pretty good too, to be honest. Yeah. No, he was he was taking over. I'll just see if I can get him out of the bedroom. <laughs> Trust me, this will be worth the wait. <laughs> oh my god! Skinny the, tie and everything. For those for those listening listening in the audio, there is a cardboard cutout of Keanu Reeves. 
Then Ryan, I got his, you, when you wake up in the morning, do you hug that or like rub its belly or something for luck? It's not his, it's his housemates. <laughs> oh. Because <laughs> I, I got him that because his, his housemates are tr- counter race tragic. Yeah, like he really people. is. But yeah. before that, like I think a couple of Christmases ago, my niece wanted, like I said, what do you want for Christmas? And she said, Hugh Jackman. Um <laughs> And then so I got her a cardboard cut out of Hugh Jackman. It was the funniest. Like they still have him around the house, hanging around the house and they dress him up for Christmas. <laughs> That's amazing. If you had that on video and got that up on Twitter or something, there's a shot that Hugh Jackman would show up for. That's what kind of guy he is. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we cool. he, he is permanently in the in the lounge room. So when we're sitting watching a movie, he's always watching a movie with us. <laughs> yeah. um, he doesn't like watching his own movies for some reason, first time. Um, he tends to be quite silent, but um, you know, I know deep down inside he's, he's enjoying them. And and then when she's not here, I cover him at night, so you know he keeps me warm and safe. I mean, because that's it's, what I he's mean, supposed to do. Exactly. If you can fall asleep with John Wick, if someone breaks into your house, I mean, right. seriously, you know, John Wick will take care of me. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now the next question. This one is my favorite. Um, as I said, judgment will definitely be occurring. Uh, we've already had a bit of a chat about a good sitcom, so I'm kind of kind of leaning towards I'm going to like your answer. But what is the greatest sitcom that was ever made? And if it's not, if it's not your favorite, what is your favorite? Oh, that's tough. Okay, so the greatest sitcom ever made is probably not my favorite. Um, no, actually, it's definitely not my favorite. I'm going to go with The Office, and not yep. to be like basic. That's because it's the greatest. We don't have to spend a lot of time talking about it. I know The Office comes up a bit. Yep. Um, but my favorite sitcom of all time, which is like comfort food to me, my mozzarella sticks in bed kind of feeling, yeah. is Scrubs. Oh, yes. I, I love Scrubs. I've been, I've been waiting been... 22 episodes for this answer. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I remember watching Scrubs through like season one through four on a loop. Yeah. Um, one January, like just couldn't stop. Yeah. Just love it. So yeah. what are your feelings on season nine? <laughs> oh, so <laughs> I slogged through it once and then I decided to like amputate it from my memory. It wasn't yeah. terrible. just wasn't scrubs. I, I think they did. They did that themselves too. When they released it on DVD and it said scrubs med school. Mm. Yeah. They kind of added the little surname. Cause that season eight <laughs> ending was just perfection. Yeah. Yeah, and, James, James, yeah Jamie got me into that as well. I, I actually was lucky enough to pick up the entire collection for 30 bucks at a, at, at a pawn shop. Oh, that's huge. DVD. Yeah. So I have, I have the whole thing as well. Jamie got me into Scrubs when I first started hanging out with him. He basically got me into Bill Lawrence in general, yeah. um, mm-hmm. you know, and um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Fantastic. Yeah. I haven't finished it yet. Writing, so that again with me. Um, I, work two, I work two jobs and I don't have, and I watch 14 hours of wrestling a week. So just nice. hold, don't hold it against me. Um, but no, I'm getting. But as I said, like I've had, I agree with you. It's one of those ones where we're in the middle of winter over here at the moment, and mm. I can just sit on my recliner with the blanket and put scrubs on and just laugh my ass off. Yeah, and the, um, I mean they get, they hit you a little bit every once in a while with that curveball yeah. where you're like, oh, existential crisis. Yep. No, Brendan Fraser. No. Yeah. Oh, I <laughs> don't. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> yeah, don't don't go to the dark place. I'm sorry. And, and, but um. Yeah. The, and I, like, I want to go see the blanks, the acapella group in the show. That, that's janitor's band. They're a real oh, band. Really? Uh, well, real um, uh, singing group. Yeah. Oh, but, it's Ted's, right? Yeah, and he passed away a couple of years back. Oh. Oh no. Um, yeah. Um, All right. Well, we have to cancel the show for tonight because I'm not emotionally <laughs> stable enough to yeah. continue. Yeah. No, I remember and, that the episode of Scrubs that has stuck with me is the. You, you, I think it was in season one, and I apologise if I'm not remembering correctly, but it's the one where there's three patients, and they're trying to say like, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Doctor Cox. Dr. Cox. That's he's season five. To keep his, yeah, and that one, and it's just he realises he just can't save everyone, and mm-hmm. and that that just, just yeah, gets yeah, and because he's such a he's such a great character, Doctor Cox, and to see him, but well, I think that's one of the first times you actually see a human side to him you know, of him not being able to, and showing that anger and that, ups, like, being upset with yeah. he just couldn't save them. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, just, yeah. 
great show. I know Jamie's desperately trying to get in a word. Sorry, Jamie. <laughs> this is his show. This is my show. It's actually this the only show that I had to buy on DVD twice because I wore the discs out. What? Is that possible? You can do that? Yeah. Wow. Well, they stopped working, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, that's went down, crazy. Went down the shop to get the cleaners, and they go, hey, this, is, this is how you clean. I go, no, nah, it didn't work. Because nope. it was just... <laughs> It was just cycling through. That's crazy. We still have um, we have the DVDs downstairs, but I'm a I'm a streaming uh, goon yeah. now, so I just Although watch it when I can. Apparently, um, and I heard this from because um, I listened to Zach Braff's um, podcast. The soundtrack's different on streaming. Oh really? Yeah, that's like, not good. Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> Like it's, yeah, that's not good because that, that was part of what made the show so yeah. great was their music choice. So there's certain um, songs that are um, missing because okay, because back when it started, it's like it's it's um they could only get the rights for television mm-hmm. and DVD and streaming wasn't around, so they didn't have the rights to put it on streaming. So now we're stuck with these really bad. You can see they're trying to find a song that's similar, but it's no, it's not the same. No. No. These, these damn lawyers. <laughs> Where's but Ted? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Where's Ted? Oh, he was my favorite. That episode where he um where he's dreaming. Mm-hmm. And, and like Dr. Kelsey's like, how would your life be any better if you had hair? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they messed with him so much. I wonder if the actor got like an inferiority complex from playing that role. He got shit on so much in that. <laughs> Just so much. No, apparently he was the most lovable um guy on this on the show. Mm. Completely like oh, everyone yeah. everyone loved him. But um the other funny the funny thing I heard was um the Todd. Yeah. He was so committed to his role that like they, they said he practiced they he was always off offset practicing line because he only ever had one or two lines. <laughs> mm-hmm. he was just, like saying it a hundred times. He's like very funny. I thought you were going to tell me he got like me too'd from slapping everybody's ass when the camera wasn't rolling or something like that. No, I, 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 th- I think he's like um, Robert Downey Jr. in the sense that he got he got away with being. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> gotcha. I just heard the I just heard the other day that um, Jamie Fox asked uh, Robert Downey Jr. to play a small role in one of his movies as a Mexican. And Ro- oh, Robert, to see if he can pull it off again. Like no, and Robert, Robert Downey's like, no, 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 no. The time and, then, and then, and then Jamie Foxx is like, dude, you got away with blackface. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, he was talking to somebody about that moment. Um, I think he was on Rogan for that interview where yeah. they were talking about him in blackface, and they were just, they were like both flabbergasted that yeah. nobody had a problem with it at all. Yeah. And even Robert Downey Jr. was like, yeah, I mean, I don't know, <laughs> it just kind of worked out. <laughs> well, he's Iron Man, so. Um... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, is it my go? Are we, are we... <laughs> I, I, I'm just checking the contracts online at your how many words you're actually allowed to say on these episodes, right. <laughs> and I think you I think you've extended it. But look, I'll let I'll let it fly for this time, mate. All right. I, I'm gonna just I'm just gonna say three words. Okay. Zombie apocalypse plan. <laughs> <laughs> Zombie apocalypse. Plan. This is a hard one because I mean, it's, you want to save your wife and kids. <laughs> And like you, that's the goal, right? I read a short story once that's so gritty. It's like a mom at home with the kids and the apocalypse is starting and kind of getting into the suburbs. You get little subtle hints here and there. And then like they're in the house and you know what's about to go down. And then the story ends. Um, And you're like, oh, the kids are done. Cool. Awesome. Let's go to sleep, I guess. (laughs) Those kinds of short stories that just horrify you. Yeah. But um, we're going to leave them out of this. I'm going to, they're going to be at, um, you know, on an island somewhere during this scenario. So I'm going to take the time to to rally up all the people that I can't stand and (laughs) get them together into a big gaggle, I think. Um, And then I'm going to leave them for a while. And I'm going to do that walking dead thing where you make a lot of noise and get a few hundred thousand of them walking in a pack. And I'm going to lead them right to those people. (laughs) And I think think that's one. I think that's going to be our Hunger Games moment during the zombie apocalypse, and I'll sit up on top of a telephone tower or something like that and eat some popcorn and just see how it goes down. Wow. <laughs> nice. It's um, dark. I, I can totally get behind that. <laughs> Completely get behind that. And uh, when you were talking about the wife and the kids, I remember when we had uh, Aussie filmmaker Matt Holmes on um, on the podcast. Uh, like he, his order of getting people to say were him, his dog, and then his wife. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, you know, <laughs> he, he had, I, I, I'm pretty sure I know for a fact that his wife is that or girlfriend has actually listened to this and watched this episode because she did yeah. make comments on it on YouTube. So uh-huh. I, I wonder how he's doing at the moment. But apparently, apparently, because she said that she only listens to podcasts that go over an hour. So we were only just over an hour. So could have gone either way. <laughs> yeah, real nail biter. <laughs> Uh, excellent. Uh, look, I, I, I still stand by my plan of we have what's like your Walmart over there, Martin. We have a, a store called Bunnings, and uh-huh. it's, it's literally a hardware store, but a, on a mass scale. I'll just go there. I mean, they've got chainsaws, they've got knives, they've got axes, hacksaws. They just have a little bit of fun. Yeah, there you go. You know, that's like um zombie land style. You go yeah. in there, you set up you set up the shopping cart, and yeah. Yep. You don't need a plan really. <laughs> Just have a bit of fun. I mean, let's face it, I'm a big guy. I'm not gonna make it that long. So I want to have a bit of fun while I'm there, you know. I want to root for the underdog on this one, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I just it depends on what kind of zombies. If we've got like the zombie land or the 28 days later zombies that run, I'm I'm yeah. Jamie, get the beep beep out. I'm fucked. But if we get the, if we've got the slow George Romero zombies, that well, yeah, I might have a chance because like I'll just steal a golf buggy or something. But yeah, I just you know, I was a brilliance to that too, though, right? That slow creeping horde that was coming, and it's like not scary. It's not scary. Oh shit, it's scary. That sort of thing. Yeah, you're looking in the distance. You're like, oh yeah, there's only ten. I yeah, could probably, yeah. and they're moving so slow. I could just sort of go in and yeah. Walking Dead makes it seem so easy. And then, and then from the ten come another ten, and another, yeah. 10, and another ten, and then it's like, okay, get in the golf buggy and go. It's almost like me with spiders. Like, yeah, I see a spider, not scared, but when it's in my car, mm. that's when I'm. <laughs> mm, you know? Yeah, that'll do it. When I don't know where it is, is it inside? Is yeah. it outside? Is it inside? Is it outside? Um, and because sometimes they look like there, yeah. <laughs> oh man. Sometimes I had it, one of my friends, she actually rolled her car because a, a huntsman, which is one of the spiders we have out here, uh, not poisonous or anything, just big and scary and hairy. Literally the uh, most harmless spider. Yeah, in yeah, literally the harmless. It fell onto her lap and she rolled her car. Yeah, see, that's my my concern. And actually for my wife, she's terrified of spiders. We have big wolf spiders around here. They like to get oh, in the car and stuff. But they're not, they're not like, um, they're not as big as the huntsman. They only get to be about the size of a silver dollar. Um so they, not terribly large. Big. I've seen them. They, they jump. Me. Yeah. They jump. Well, the thing, when we moved into this house, um, we ended up, you know, we're going up the stairs our third night here or something. And there's like one like this on the mm. stairs and she freaks out. She's like, you got to kill it. You got to kill it. And I'm not really, I don't feel like I have the right to kill things generally. I'm not like vegan and all this stuff, but I just don't like to murder a living thing yeah. <laughs> for no good reason. That's kind of my take. So long story short, um, she made me kill it and I <laughs> grabbed my sandal. I was like, all right, here we go. You ready? <laughs> you ready? She's upstairs already. She managed to bypass it and see it after she walked by. So I swing. The thing does like a matrix leap, goes <laughs> this way and off down to the side, like falls down to the first floor. So I go downstairs and all she hears from upstairs is <laughs> like, son of a bitch. <laughs> over and over again she's like martin are you there and i just like i got quiet for a second <laughs> freaked her out a little bit but it that thing took at least five solid whacks just like that and he was still kind of twitching and uh, i was just like so, all right well i don't want to piss off the rest of them so this is gonna yeah. be the last spider i murder well she she's heard you hit it once with the sandal and then all she's heard is round one fight <laughs> yeah. the, hell fire you hear the, the dalsy yeah. music starts playing yoga uh, no I, I have massive arachnophobia so even talking about spiders sort of gives me the chills but right, yeah, I've, I, I, I got no problem i just catch them <laughs> i i you know a bit of gl- glass or tupperware slide a bit of cardboard under it take it outside 95 percent of the time i throw it out and the kookaburra will come and eat it so oh there you go i didn't kill it circle of life <laughs> yeah there you go. but circle. i just the the other day i, I was at work because i work from home two days a week and work in the office to rest and I, I, I was just about to leave for work and I get a text message from my housemate, uh, Steph, and she's like, whatever you do, don't lift up the red container when you get home. Oh, no. I'm going for a nap. 
So I've How do you seen nap that. with it there. She loves him. She won't let, she's like your wife. She won't she won't let me kill him, even though I'm the one asking her to kill him because I'm scared rubbers. Like, but mm-hmm. she said, Yeah, I'm going for a nap. I've had a massive day. I've got a headache. Don't move the red, don't lift up the red container on the kitchen sink, kitchen bench. And I replied back, what do you mean? And she didn't reply. And then I come back and she's cleaned the whole house. And there's a red, there's one a red Tupperware container upside down in the middle of the kitchen bench. And I'm like, right. And the container's probably about this big. So it's a, it's like a bucket. Okay. Right. So this is this is for Jamie as well. I haven't told him this story yet. But so I go in and I walk past, I'm like, yeah, she's maybe she's just messing with me or something. The bucket moves. <laughs> Are you serious? The bucket moves. And then I'm I scream like a girl. She comes bouncing out of the out of her bedroom because she has a bedroom down next to the kitchen. It's a converted garage, so it's huge. She comes out running out of the bedroom, says, No, 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 lift up the bucket, and there's our rabbit. Oh. <laughs> my my best mate, Benji, we got a new rabbit because we foster rabbits, and we ended up adopting this one. He's named Benji. He's my best mate. He follows me around the house like a bad smell, and I love him to bits. And it, she she planned this whole prank knowing how much I hate spiders. Uh-huh. Jamie that's knows brilliant. this, so she, he's like, yeah, that's coming from her evil genius mind. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, so that's how much I hate spiders. And I, I thought there was there's something, there's a big one under this freaking Tupperware container. I was about ready to run out of the house. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, sorry to dig, distract, but I thought. No, that was that's awesome. The only time you'll ever hear me talking about spiders ever. Yeah, we we can we can bury the topic now, I guess. <laughs> Just for you. <laughs> thank you, thanks, man. All right, last of the ice icebreakers. Um, so, Mr. Elon Musk calls you up, uh, and he's gone. Look, Martin, I've just I've heard I love your work. I've invented this electric time machine. I want you to test drive it, and I'll add something in here because our other guests always say you can go anywhere you want, forward, backwards, and I, here's a little watch. You push this button. And you come back to the exact moment that you left. What do you do? Where do you go? Ah, this one's so hard because there's so many cool things you can do if you can go to the future. Mm-hmm. I was gonna go meet my future son, see if he turned out to be a scumbag or something, yep. mess with him, come back. And then I was like, well, I mean, like, what year do you go to? At that yeah. point? Do I get him at like 88 and just <laughs> mess with him there? <laughs> you know, whatever. So I I decided to be a prankster again, I guess. And I'm going to, it's going to take a little talent because I think he's in Graceland, but I'm going to need Elvis Presley's remains for this one. Okay. I'm going to go get those. I don't know how some people <laughs> might have to go to prison for it, but I'm going to get those. And then, um, and I'm going to take those with me back to right after they closed up the tomb for King Tut. Okay. And I'm going to swap them out. <laughs> I'm going to swap them out. And I'm just going to, I'm going to enjoy seeing what the backlash from that was like in the nineties when they finally opened that, opened up that sarcophagus and pulled out Elvis. <laughs> wow. I want to see that is Nicolas it? Cage national treasure movie for sure. In his costume? Is he going to be in his costume? Yeah, hundred percent. Oh. I'm going to put like real mutton chops back on him <laughs> too. Maybe I can choose somebody else's DNA for that. Hugh Jackman. <laughs> to make it really Hugh Jackman. <laughs> There you go. Oh, it just wow. seems like science, the scientific community has been flipped on its head. Oh, Let's see what brilliant. goes on. He's me <laughs> wanting to go back and just make some money, but I like that. Yeah. Like Those are good. That. I mean, money's fine, but, you know, destroying people's perception of reality is kind of better. Yeah. But then yeah. I guess you could, you could always place a bet and say, oh, when they open this tomb, I bet this is going to be inside. You know, yeah. Do the bookie thing. But what I want to see is the Ocean's Eleven star movie that you're going to need to with the team to get Elvis's remains. Yeah, to begin that's with, that's going to be the hard part. We're going to have to we're going to have to get a patsy. We're going to have to get yep. uh, at least two strong backs to do some fast digging. It's not going to be easy. <laughs> well, uh, okay, so your next book coming out is called Elvis versus Two uh, yep. It's going to go. be Elvis uh, Elvis Hotep. Yeah, it's going to <laughs> it's going to be a Lansdale original. Nice. Oh man, I think that's. I don't know, Jamie. I think that's the best answer. Yeah. Ever. Really? I thought I you guys were going to think it was lame. Like, the, no. the best one before this was Michael Tanner's, where he said he was going to go back in time 
kill Elon Musk's dad and take over the diamond mine so that he would be Elon Musk. But that one, that one tops that. I, I, I like that. I love me. I like mind. Tanner's too, because he started a paradox. Without yeah. Elon Musk, do we have the time machine? And then can I come yeah. back? I enjoyed that answer. Yeah. He's a cool um, guy. I think, yeah, I think he's just, I think, I think Martin's just surpassed that yeah. I think this one is now my favorite. So well done. I and it's also it. the longest right. running um, icebreaker. Are you sure? Julian Claire's was pretty long, but um, well, at, at this point, I'll, I'll let you know when I've edited. Okay. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> All right. Well, we've gotten through the icebreakers. Thank you for you, thank you for, for for diverting with us, Mark. I appreciate it. <laughs> it was fun. Nah, we don't have to spend too much time on the stupid book anyway. Let's do more icebreakers. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, you learn from us. We don't have a set time for our podcast. We just. No. I don't care if they go forty-five minutes or go for two and a half hours. It doesn't matter. Or, it's all or, about the chat. And yeah. um, so why don't you jump in? Tell us a bit about yourself. Um, tell us how you got into writing, um, where you're based, and then we'll start hitting the nitty gritty of your books. All right. Um, based in New York, uh, born in Valhalla, New York, which when you hear the series name, you'll kind of yep. be like, ooh. I know. Um, <laughs> in, in a hospital that no longer exists. But oh. um, but uh, that town was named by a guy who came over here. I don't know if he was German. I think he might have been German. Um, and he loved the song Flight of the Valkyrie. And if yep. you look it up or if you're aware, okay. Anybody who's listening, if you pull it up on Spotify, you're going to hear three seconds go, oh, because yeah. you've heard it a thousand times in movies. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, been in New York ever since. I have a lot of family out in Houston um, as well that I bop over to see, which will come up later when we talk more about the book as well. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I currently, a, um, I'm a special ed and English teacher at a regional alternative high school. So it's for students who have um, pretty high needs and they really need a smaller setting. And yeah. I just love my, it's exhausting, but I love my job because yeah. there's no such thing as a boring day yeah. at all. Um, so have a lot of fun with that. I come home, I have two little boys and a beautiful, wonderful wife who loves them and likes me. Um, <laughs> and, and they suck the rest of the energy out of me once I get home, which I'm totally okay with at this point. Yeah. Um, and um, as far as writing goes, um, when I was younger, I kind of had an interesting go of it in like elementary and stuff like that. Home life was a little interesting as well. So books were a good escape. I didn't even start reading until I was like way, way older. I like my peers were reading much younger. I remember that being a problem. My godmother, I was like, you can't read? It's like, no, is that a problem? And then I spent the whole summer reading stupid books. I was like, damn it, I should have said yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I ended up falling in love with them. There's books, um, before I got into like R.L. Stein and stuff, there were books mm. like Monstering. Yep. Um, if, if you, you know that one? Yeah, I do. I, they're so obscure, some of them, but I, I get so excited when somebody knows that one. It's just the best thing for a little kid to read is a kid goes to like that, that um, sort of forbidden antique shop and picks out the ring. Yeah. And the guy's I like, don't turn it during the full moon, <laughs> that sort of thing. No, I love that. I grew up on, I grew up on Goosebumps. I grew up on that kind of stuff. And I still read Goosebumps now. I, it's just, a, it's, there's something about R.L. Stein. It's nostalgic, but there's, oh, okay, here we go. Let's have a look. <laughs> no. I'm trying to see where he is. I have, so um, oh, here he is. Uh, superstitious down here. Yeah. I don't know if it's too far away. He's over here above Paradise Sky by Lansdale. I should pull it out, show you the signature, which I think I will do. Hold That's on. the one with the, um, the oh, I'll wait till you come back. The sound of my voice, gentlemen. <laughs> I know the book he's talking about, Jamie. So this one, this one kind of comes with a bit of a um, interesting story. Yes, please. And not, not to cut you off. Um, yep. But my wife was going to Comic Con one year, and I couldn't go. And mm -hmm. R.L. Stein was going to be there at a booth. I said, "Oh, can you do me a favor? I've had this book of his, superstitious, mm -hmm. that nobody's read except for apparently me and Ryan, <laughs> and um, and it's an adult book, and it's pretty gritty mm -hmm. and pretty graphic too. And yep. I read it at like twelve, <laughs> and um, you know, I like fell in love with it. Yeah, there's a lot of like ritual sex and stuff yeah. in this book. <laughs> and, it's not um, a traditional R.L. Stein book. No, definitely not. It's a, it's pretty damn good though. Yeah, it is. And she um she brought it up to him, and he was so tickled that he didn't get another damn Goosebumps book mm -hmm. to sign. He doesn't personalize. 
Mm. He's, you know, he's got 10,000 yeah. people coming to his booth. So he's just hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. And um, he, he gave me, he gave me this guy right here. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I got the name, so this should be behind the glass. But I'm a goon, and I don't take care of my things. It should. It's above remember, where the kids can get. Out. I remember when, um, back in back in high school, I had an accident at school and broke my back, and I was in hospital for a couple of months, right? Um, and one of my close friends bought that. That was around the time Superstitious came out, and I had it was only the paperback cover, the cover with the cat with the blue coming out of its mouth. Um, and he bought that for me in hospital. And once I sort of got over, I got used, sort of got past the pain. I think I read it three times while I was in hospital. It's absolutely yeah. fantastic book. It's very not his style, seeing as I'd only read Goosebumps before. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a little bit older. I was 15 when it happened. So I was a little bit older than you. So I was right in the middle of puberty. And I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. I can do oh, yeah. <laughs> Get after it. Yeah, I, I'm so glad that there's someone else out there who's actually read it because every time I speak, I mention R.L. Stein, it's all, all Fear Street or Goosebumps. So yeah, yeah that's awesome. I mean, that one that one pulled me in and wouldn't let go. And then there's another one. It's not by R.L. Stein. I feel like a jerk. I don't remember the author's name, but it's called Fun House. Okay. And it's your, it's your like, basically the framework is just your um, creature feature sort of teens are going to die book, mm -hmm. but it's, it, he ties in like this stepbrother aspect of what the monster and stuff. It's so good I'm gonna for to, that I'm age. Gonna have to search that one out for sure. Yeah. It's either the fun house or fun house. And um, yeah, I just, I just got pulled into those and then I got really wrapped up in early Kuntz. Um and I was in like the fifth grade when I was reading Coon and my older cousin, my cousin's four or five years older and he was getting them because his dad traveled a lot and would pick up Dean Coon's books at an airport. He yep. wouldn't read them. He just give them to his son. If he knew what was in him, he probably wouldn't have given them to his son. <laughs> yeah. And then they turnkeyed that to me. And there's like lightning was one of the early ones, mm -hmm. which is about a Nazi who goes back in time. Spoiler alert, everybody. And, um, and it's sort of like that lake out. What is that? Um, movie with the lake house where they're putting the letters in and time traveling or it's called the lake house <laughs> the lake house right on the nose huh i, yeah, I know that because like that's, that. that's a keanu movie that's a keanu movie yeah, it is a keanu, keanu and that's why i'm not going to say anything disparaging about it but it's that <laughs> just out of respect for the reeves yeah but it's that but awesome <laughs> is the best way to put it it's yeah. like it's really good time traveler book if you haven't read lightning and then uh midnight if anybody's Never read Kuntz. Midnight is one of the best creature books you can probably pick up from the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Okay. Um, and then on and on. You've got Winter Moon, which is another one. That's like one of the early ones with other dimensional stuff yep. before King was doing it all the time. Um, I mean, early Kuntz, he gets a lot of flack from current weird fiction and horror writers. I guess he's born again and he's not nice on Twitter or something. Yeah. But I've, I've never seen it. But um, his early stuff just like ripped me out of whatever I was doing, and I would just stay in bed for nine hours and and tear through his books. Mm. Yeah, I, I had I haven't I was more of a Stephen King guy, but I did definitely jump into Coons. But just a quick question on the Funhouse: Would the writer have been Owen West? It may have been. I have to look at the cover because the if it own. is Owen West, I found the book. Did it come out in around about the late eighties? Yeah, that would probably be it. Would it Owen shock West. you to? To let you know that Owen West is a pseudonym of Dean Coots. Oh my God. <laughs> yep, there's Dean Coots Funhouse. Yep. So there you go. But wow. he published it under his pseudonym Owen West. I just Cut caught up the because I'm looking for it because I want to read it this afternoon. And I was just checking to see if it's on Amazon. And I found the Wikipedia and it's actually Dean Coots under a pseudonym of Owen West. So there you go. You sneaky bastard. Yeah. So he, um, the, one of them without the pseudonym Dean Koontz has four stars. And the one yep. that says Owen West pseudon, pseudon, uh, pseudonym Dean Koontz has two stars. <laughs> <laughs> you angry Amazon reviewers. Oh, I'll tell you what. Oh, well, there you go. But yeah, because I, I absolutely, you know, I love my horror books and there's not enough out there. So I'm, anytime I speak to someone who's got references or who's got a book of their own, I will jump straight on that. Those are good. Those are good books. And um, it's not, you don't have to like get into kind of what I do as a writer, but um, like the extra layered story stuff. Now you're just getting the, the action thriller with those. And I sort of dig that escape. So if we had to say, if we had to talk about some of your favorite authors, obviously you've already touched on Dean Crudes. You've um, touched on that other gentleman whose name I forgot who wrote um, No Country for Old Men. 
Um, I don't have a, the best memory. I do apologise. Um, but yeah, so what are you? What are you? Some of your other favourite authors? I can see some Stephen King on the back shelf yeah, there a little bit. Too. For some reason, his publishers think it's a good idea to make his name really big <laughs> on his books. I guess for some strange reason. Um, by the way, Jamie, I've got my Final Fantasy up here just for you. Nice. Nice. Just for you, by the way. I'm looking nice. forward to 16 coming out too. The Me trailer too. dropped yesterday. Yeah, um, I've only watched it about 17 times, so. I haven't seen it yet. I'm going to watch oh. it right after this. Mm. I can't wait. Yeah. Can't wait. Um, but over here is where the, the guys that I'm like reading right now are. Mm -hmm. Actually, I got King over here too. He's leeching into everything. I'm going to put, <laughs> put some of those away. Um, but Paul Tremblay, who's actually, um, he's not a King disciple, but King, King works with him a little bit. Okay. Um, he's actually a math teacher. He's a brilliant writer. Survivor Song came out right at the beginning of the pandemic, and it has to do with like, it's a zombie-esque book. Oh, wow. Um, which focused kind of in the Northeast. And I was in the middle of penning Beneath the Veil when I read that. And he's just a good writer. He's okay. And he's got some gritty stuff, some hard to read stuff sometimes. Um, Laird Barron uh, is probably my favorite horror writer right now. Okay. Um, and you know what's great about Barron is that he's his best work. Uh, I actually can't even say that. Um, some of his best work are his short stories so you can mm -hmm. grab his his um collections and just cruise through one a night and just and you might only want to read one a night because they're that good oh, and no. you kind of want to reflect on them a little bit um but he's he's nest like there's so much folklore and stuff in the background of his writing it feels alive it feels like you're stuck in the woods with whatever's going on and freaks you the hell out um he's he's probably the only writer i've ever read that legitimately scares the shit out of me sometimes oh wow okay yeah. Um, his buddy, uh, they both live in New York. I've never met them. They're, they're too good for me anyway. But um, John Langan, also the Fisherman's mm -hmm. right over here. Yep. He's more of a literary writer. The Fisherman's one of the one of the best books okay. that you can just grab and have at it a go. Um, I'll, I'll throw all these in a message to you guys. Yeah, because so I'm, I'm literally, worry. as you're typing, I'm going, okay, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, the Fisherman by Langan is is brilliant. It's unbelievable. Um, he had a collection too. He does, he created his own mythos. Baron created his own mythos. Mm -hmm. And Baron's mm -hmm. done um, crime noir novels recently, which I, I thought was an interesting choice at first. Um, then I was 30 pages into the first one and I was like, no, whatever he writes is fucking great. Like, <laughs> they do no wrong. But it, they're called the Coleridge novels and Blood Standard is the first one. Um, he should be paying me for this. Worst Angels is the most recent one, and they're just really good. But the um, I if you're gonna start one of his short story collections, yeah, I recommend the beautiful thing that awaits us all. The beautiful thing that awaits us all. Excellent. Yep, and it's got the Ouroboros on the uh, cover. Okay. Yep. Nice. I'm I've always been obsessed with that symbol, so uh, maybe that's why. And then another really good one if you wanna if you wanna read something that might take you out of your comfort zone anything literally anything by keelan patrick burke mm -hmm. but um if you want to start with we live inside your eyes the title might give away that it's not a, <laughs> it's not a huggy kind of novel um is just fantastic and his short story collections that are halloween themed okay are, every one of them is good excellent so these are all guys that i've been i mean i write fantasy urban fantasy contemporary fantasy whatever you want to call it um these days and it's dark I, I, I inject horror in it because I'm, I am a horror fan, mm -hmm. but I love that. I love the epic, the fantasy epic a la Neil Gaiman. Yeah. Oh, Neil name. Gaiman. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's unbelievable. So I like, I wanted to kind of just do the absolute wrong thing. And I think Jamie's going to know what I mean by this and just like try to do everything with my very first novel. Cause <laughs> that, why wouldn't that work? Um, <laughs> And I did. I married the two concepts together, and I actually think I did balance it okay. okay. But and the reviews kind of, it, it, if people, if it hit right, people loved it, and if people found it like there was too dense because it is a dense book. There's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. um, or if people were fantasy fans or horror fans, sometimes I lose a little bit in translation there. But okay. for the most part, these guys right now are just, they're such good writers. And I can't, I can't um, make it a boys club thing. Gemma Files is unbelievable. And she's a film uh, lover too. So her, okay. one of her novels, Experimental Film, ties in a, an old folk tale, Lady Midday. Um, and also like really ties into this great concept of, um, and awareness for autism. And okay. none of it's forced. It's all just a really good story. So... And, and that's it's very hard to do because, you, I mean, I read a lot 
So I mm-hmm. reading is one of my it's aside from gaming is my most favorite thing to do in the whole wide world. And one thing I don't like is putting a character of a certain, you know, sexual orientation, race or whatever, and just forcing it in where it doesn't belong. Like mm-hmm. I'm all for I don't care what race, what sexual orientation, what ethnicity you are. Just tell me a good story. I don't care. Yeah. You don't even have to tell me what orientation, what race. I just, if the story's good, I don't care. Mm. It's all about the story. And too many people get focused on, oh, we need this. You know what I mean? Like, I just I want hear you. Story. No, I mean, and that's because you're a purist. So yeah. it, if, if it's something that's forced and there's an agenda first, it's not mm-hmm. going to be no. that good. Now, you and I are both screwed because Twitter is going to hear this at some point and we're fucked. But <laughs> honestly, that should be like, yeah, of course, you want to have something that was designed to be a good story first. Mm. And if the story revolves around sexual orientation, race, things like that, then it's a good story for that purpose. That's one thing. But if you're just trying to, to state a message or something like that, and you don't have the story there, there's no life in it. Yeah. That's not a good. <laughs> it's not I, good. Yeah, exactly. Well, look, we're going to make sure we get all those authors that you mentioned to send your checks. Um, oh, that'd be nice. <laughs> and, and, and thank you for expanding my weekend now because there's so many more. Or I've just been Googling all of the books and authors you've told me. So I'm going to be doing lots of reading this weekend. Mm-hmm. But we're here to talk about you. Yeah. So oh, let's yeah. let's yeah. talk about, let's start with Terminal Link, um, which oh, I believe wow. is your short story. So Somebody's tell us about, and then we'll something. move into obviously Beneath the Veil and your, your book. So tell us about, tell us right. about Terminal Link. Terminal Link was a... Uh, a short story. I tried to get it into Nightmare Magazine and a few other, and that's really tough to get into anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and I need to refine my writing a bit, I think, to get into there as well. But um, I got a, I got a rejection, but I got a nice blurb, and you don't always get that from magazines. And the editor of Nightmare is no slouch either, so I was like, okay, I'll take that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, need, I haven't gotten it into anything yet. I'm, I kind of stopped trying actually because it's not really on my agenda. But it's, um, I put it out for free. You can get, I think it's out. Um, you can get it through Story Origin or BookBub or something like that. And um, it's on the website. There's a free link there, readkerns.com. And um, plug. And <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll be doing plenty of that. Don't <laughs> you worry. I'll be it's right there on the screen. It's right there on the screen. There it is. <laughs> right there. So, um, you know, I work with a guy at our school who's, who's amazing. His name's Randy. And um, I was watching him one day. He does this thing when kids are acting a fool. He stands at the top. We have these balconies on it. We, alternative high school really weird setting we teach out of ranch style houses raised ranches oh, nice. and there's like a stairs that go up to a second floor and there's a balcony there and randy will just sit there at the top <laughs> <laughs> and kind of stare at them and eventually they feel it you know like on their neck like what is that and they look and they see him looking at him and they they continue to try being you know schmucks and he just keeps looking until they stop and it works 100 percent of the time <laughs> And I was like, what happened in his life where he's that good at being spooky sort of thing? And I just got, <laughs> I got this, this character popped up and I was like, I wouldn't want to screw with him even if he was 88 years old sort of thing. And I just started thinking about this guy in a nursing home with dementia and I was, and this whole backstory came out of it. And um, I wanted something of like the creeping past. I actually ended up, I, um, Max Booth is a, is a good writer. He's a gritty writer too. He writes some crazy stuff. Okay. And he had a collection he was doing, and he said, I need you to send me something that has um, technology, something about technology and horror. And I, I wanted to wrap up the cell phone into it a bit. Yeah. So that's in there. And it's a short read. It's, it's 5,000 words. Um, I think one of my favorite reviews of it by a reader was like, ghost story, finds them. <laughs> that was it. Four <laughs> stars. It's like, all right, four stars. Cool. But um, yeah, that's basically, you know, it's about the creeping past. He's a Korean war veteran. He's in a nursing home pretty much against his will battling um, dementia. And it's, he's aware of it kind of peeling away layers of him and he's not too pleased about it. He's got this kind of pessimistic outlook about the whatever future he's still got. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, just kind of ro- rolled with that happy thought until we reached the conclusion of a pretty dark story. No, excellent. I look forward to reading it. I got my copy this morning from because if you go to uh, listeners, if you go to Martin Kern's website, which we will be plugging the absolute crap out of, oh, <laughs> um, you can you can click on the very first thing up the top. If you scroll down, you can click on it. You can actually download a copy. Just register your interest, and and it's free. So everyone loves free stuff. 
Um, so we'll definitely, I'll definitely be reading it this afternoon. So I'm really, really looking forward to that. Uh, nice. Um, there so are yeah. going to be more free stories up there soon. I'm going to do a collection <laughs> that's going to go with this series, by the way, because I need to write pure horror again, or I'm going to dry out. Yeah. And so if you're interested in that, the underneath <laughs> terminal link soon, there'll be a few more. Great. Well, there you go. I'll let Jamie do some more talking. I think he's got about another 700 words to go. Okay. Tell us. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, why don't we talk about the Beneath the Veil? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so Beneath the Veil is book one of the Valor of Val the Valor of Valhalla series. Sorry. Uh, and, ten um, times fast. <laughs> and i over here my my kids actually for father's day two years ago did like this cool watercolor thing oh, awesome. and put valor of uh, i should go grab that too tethered um you can kind of see it in the corner there if you triple yeah. zoom in but um they um they put that together my aided by my lovely wife and oh. that was right after i finished the first draft and like i was bleeding out of the eyes because um <laughs> at the time of writing it I would, it was during the pandemic and everybody's like, oh yeah, you know, teachers were at home freeloading. Blah, blah, yeah, blah, yeah, blah, oh that. yeah. <laughs> we're, a, we're, yeah, we're, a, we're on alternative high school. So it's not like you'd be like, log in, get your assignment, do it. No, we're on the phone. We had this coalition of the willing that came together. My, um, eh, I probably shouldn't name him or, or say his title actually. Oh, a God. really great guy we work with that's a, a good leader. Um, he recognizes the kind of the strengths in all of us too. sort of grabbed us all together, said, here's what we should do. What do you guys think? And we all kind of divvied up the labor a bit and uh, went after it and we managed it, but it was like 12 hours a day because we're oh, putting wow. together PDFs and stuff. We've got to do the lessons. We've got to call the kids. They're trying to show us their balls on zoom and stuff. It's a nightmare. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Sorry, I shouldn't laugh. I shouldn't laugh. You it's should good. laugh because that's okay. the best part of the job is that that hilarious aspect. I mean, if I'm going to be a stick in the mud, I need a new job. <laughs> if I'm going to, if you work with teenagers, you better enjoy teenage. I mean, yeah. I don't like seeing their balls. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but I appreciate the uh, the joking mindset that that comes from, I suppose. So I think we've we got the promo for the episode right there, Martin. Jamie, <laughs> cue that up for the YouTube you know, like, for this episode. <laughs> I think I'm safe <laughs> as far as that goes, but, um, yeah, we, I mean, we love our kids and, um, we put in that all that time and stuff. And then my wife kind of, one day I just started writing that book. I pulled up, um, cause I was on the computer all the time. Anyway, I pulled up one that I started like 10 years ago and I had, okay. I had a few words down and I was like, I really should finish this okay. or start it really. I had barely anything done. And, um, I just started, we would have dinner after I'd be finished at like six and then, I'd spend a little time. My Charlie was just barely a thing. He was like six months old or something. Oh, he was born in February. We're, yeah, not even six months, like three months old. And uh, Daniel was two. And, you know, we put him to bed and she was so supportive. She would just do her thing while I'd sit down and write. And I'd start at nine and probably finish up at one or two. Wow. Um, I didn't have to worry about commuting. So I could, I could sleep yeah. for some reason two years ago. I could live on six hours of sleep like I could all my life. Now... <laughs> something happened. I don't know what happened, but I can't do it right now. Um, and I would just, you know, rinse and repeat took me about 90 days. Wow. And with, I'd say about averaging about five hours a night for actually penning it. It was, it was 93,000 words to start and, um, whittled it down to 84, which as one does mm -hmm. the beginning, by the way, Jamie was like the world's biggest exposition dump. <laughs> <laughs> when i reread it i was like oh dear lord uh, and you don't even realize you're doing it yeah you know um so I, I revised that and i i kept like the best part of it and then my wife went through it and was like it's still not that good so i wow. she's a great wow. alpha reader she's honest yeah. so i went through and i was like oh she's right so i i um i added retracted revised and then, um, you know, did the whole, did the whole story. I think I self-edited nine times, had a developmental editor hit it. Um, and then, uh, a copy in line. And then I revised after each one of those two. And then I did one more and we had to self-proof cause I ran out of money yeah. <laughs> that almost yep. went tits up, but, uh, we only, I think we only have three typos in the finished, uh, in the finished one, which is about on par mm -hmm. with random house and penguin and all that. So I'll take it. And there you have it. We, um, I had the finished product and what it is, is really the story kind of hit me when I was coming home from college at about 22 years old, 
one of the last times I was heading back down, I went to school about three hours away from home yeah. and I'm driving over this bridge that goes over the Hudson river. It's called mm -hmm. the Newburgh beacon bridge. And it is a big old turd. <laughs> it is just not, it's not where you want to be when you're stuck in traffic. And we were stuck. There was an accident by the toll booths back when that was a thing. Yeah. And, um, we were on there for like an hour, hour and a half. And I was, I was in the right lane. So kind of looking down at the water glistening in the moonlight there. And I was like, if we go into the drink, any of us going to come out of that thing? I don't know. <laughs> Pretty high up. So I was kind of like trying to weigh the odds, wondering what I would do and stuff. And the story just sort of grew from that concept. And I, I had a, a whiteboard back then. And I just started putting down name like Azazel, David, and started doing like that weird, like the, a beautiful mind crap, but mm -hmm. it made less sense. <laughs> just like <laughs> lines everywhere, it's psycho stuff. And um, I started writing. I wrote forty thousand words of it when I was younger, and they were absolute rubbish. So I got rid of them. Mm -hmm. Like there was one night I came home twisted, and I was like, "You're a hack. You'll never be anything." Delete <laughs> on my old IBM computer, oh, and yeah. um, and it, yeah, just I got through. And um, it really is the the heart of the story is nothing like what it was in my mind when I started writing it, which is my favorite part about it. Um, it starts out with a, a kid who's just like me, just this vanilla, very forgettable character in the beginning, who's just this kid who's idealistic, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and he doesn't, he just doesn't have any concept of what the real world is. He just wants like a quiet life with his girlfriend mm -hmm. and no drama. Yeah. And, that's and the way it works, big guy. <laughs> yeah. So there's a bridge collapse in the story. He goes into the drink. Um, I don't know if he comes out. You're gonna have to buy it. Uh, that <laughs> Amazon <laughs> links on my website. <laughs> nice. Um, but uh, the story rolls on. He is a he is a bit of a wildcat for a mother. Um, few other characters popped into it. I can name them. Um, girlfriend's name is Rose. His girlfriend's name is Rose. And um, <laughs> Dodd is a detective, um, old retired detective. He works for Homeland Security now. If you work for Homeland Security, you probably shouldn't read the book. Uh, <laughs> th things are stated. <laughs> and not, not that I have a problem with it. It's just that it, the way the book went, Dodd kind of says some stuff about the organization. Um, I, can, I can hear all the Homeland Security people that listen to this podcast just switching off now. Just right now, I'm going. I'm gone. I, was, I was down until that very moment. <laughs> Trust me, they've, but, they've probably already read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're the uh, I've seen the one and two star on Amazon. And I'm like, oh, you, damn it! Should have kept my mouth shut. Um, but uh, I've always been a huge fan of Joseph Campbell. If you guys are familiar with him, he's this um, he's this mega mind about mythology and this connective, this collective mm -hmm. consciousness concept. Um, what he found out, he wrote. Um, a lot of things that inspired um, George Lucas and Spielberg All right. okay. and, and the way they write stories or the way their scripts kind of track is based on his hero of a thousand faces concept, which is right. essentially that like every story is a story of Jesus or Adam and Eve. And if you boil it all down enough, you kind of get to it. You get your Gandalf coming yeah. back. Oh, he's the white now. He's better than he was. Yeah, I think I've That's heard of that now you mention it. Yeah, he's yeah. good. I mean, you don't even have to slog through. So his writing is dense. Um, but if you do go after his stuff, the mythology stuff is really interesting. Because okay. he connected myths from Australia and other continents that were uh, that were budding at the same time where the people had no way of communicating with each other. Yeah. But they're the same myth. Oh, um, wow. So he's wondering how the human psyche conjures that similar concept and if mm. there is a connection between all people and all sorts of stuff. He, he kind of blows up your mind. So if you're into that sort of thing, you know, have at it. And <laughs> um, I, I just always loved myths. I thought it was super cool. Um, yeah. So I know a lot about them. I research them. I kind of like went into my own little like what is God thing for a while and studied all the religions uh, mm -hmm. for a wee bit. Um, I was raised Catholic. Um, I guess you'd say I'm agnostic now. I'm still trying to figure it all out. But um, the you know, I, I, my member making my mom flip that one. Sorry, mom, if you're listening, she saw a copy <laughs> of the Quran, like in like, on like September 12th, 2001. She like saw that on my bookshelf <laughs> back when, you know, things weren't really looking too good for having a Quran in your bookshelf in New York state. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's another beautiful story when you read it, it's just the, the third Testament of the Bible really, mm. or of the Abrahamic religions. If you go with the, uh, Ju Judaism, then Christianity, yeah. then 
um, Islamic. It's, it's just a continuation of the concepts. Um, and it's just really great stories too. There's just really awesome stories in there, just like the other two books. So I, all of that sort of rushed out of me and into this novel. And I wanted to have these mythological figures. And I actually um, have a, an Australian myth in there, or is mm. it a myth? The Bunyip. Ah, the Bunyip. Ah, yeah. the Bunyip. Love your Bunyips. Yep. He's in yep. there. Well, he's he's in there. Um, but it, that's on the website too. There's a little like wiki yep. screenshot down down below. You can spot. Um, I'm I, more I love that to the Yowie. I'm more the Yowie. Ah, yeah, I was just saying it now. Yeah. Tell oh, me about right. the Yowie. Well, in the nineties, they were a chocolate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh. No, but, but essentially, it's our version of Bigfoot. Yeah. Oh, okay. But but our Yowies, apparently they can rotate their feet so they can make you think you're walking in the other direction. That's awesome. That sounds like an SCP or something. Yeah. So they like, do you think they're heading towards you, but they're actually yeah. running away? So you, yeah, that's... you got to learn to follow them backwards. <laughs> that's neat. Yeah. That's pretty neat. Um, yeah, I'd be partial to that one too if I had it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I like the Bunyip myth. Uh, I think it's uh, it's from... I think it's an Aboriginal myth too. It, yes. start, it's, it started with the Aboriginals, but then there's a um, European version. Like so when when the settlers came out, they, they had their they own version. It. Yeah, they essentially can't take that. Their carbon copy version doesn't count. <laughs> All right, lads, we're going to take that. <laughs> yeah. That's our myth. It's, it's yours. We've taken your um, land. That's cool. And now though, we're taking too. your myth. <laughs> your bun yip. <laughs> Tally ho. Um, wow. There's it's good stuff. And, um, I like that one because it's more like, and, and you'll see, like, if you th know about the Hudson river, it's pretty well polluted mm -hmm. and stuff. And ooh, and there may be a bunny up in the Hudson river in the book. And, um, yeah. yeah, you get into that whole, like the concept of it is as though if you start mistreating the river, they're going to mess you up. Yeah. Um, so you'll see some of that. There's some Babylonian creatures in there. there's demons galore in books one and two, um, like a bird shot of demonology kind of hits you. And, you know, there's some, there's some exposition and explanation. I was going to go the game and way and just kind of let people figure it out. And then I was mm -hmm. like, that's not that kind of book. No. Like the ocean at the end of the lane. If you've read that uh, novella of his, you got to kind of know your stuff a little bit to figure out what he's like alluding to, but you don't need yeah. that to enjoy the story. Um, with this, you kind of need to know what I'm, what I'm pointing at to know what's going mm -hmm. on in the tale. So, you know, the mythology's in there, the, um, David ends up with an unfortunate circumstance that kind of brings him into the world beneath the veil, the afterlife, so to speak. And we kind of see some interesting stuff. There's, mm -hmm. there's the river sticks, you get the ferryman trope. And I add a little twist to that, which people have enjoyed greatly and just some other stuff. And he's got to find himself just kind of like we all do when we're 22, but with this fantastic story wrapped around it. Um, what's interesting about the book with me though, is that the characters that ended up becoming meaty and good, weren't david and jacob in the story D jacob being kind of his guide it was um rose oh wow rose rose up as this like five foot one titan and mm -hmm. as i wrote her she just kept gaining steam and getting better and better and better and i started focusing on her more and more um and yeah i mean readers absolutely love her and the dynamic between her chelsea and dot as well has been pretty well received so um, you have, you get parallel stories going at the same time with David's journey and, and the trio in the other world. Um, and you'll have your three or four scenes of some gritty horror, not too gory. I tried to scale back a bit and make sure it was just sort of spooky. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, that's um, book one. And it, it, it doesn't end on a cliffhanger so much as it ends on a punch in the face. Okay. And readers have reacted <laughs> to that. I mean, there's some people who've reviewed it who had like were um requested reviewers as well mm -hmm. who've been like they didn't know it was a trilogy at the time it was a trilogy it might be a, a two book series now as i'm getting through the middle of the second book i'm wondering if i don't want to extend it to a trilogy but um that she didn't she's like why would i end the book like i did if there wasn't a sequel there's like a, there's, an, <laughs> there's an epilogue <laughs> like, <laughs> there's a scene directly afterward that leads into the second book that's like yeah it was really confusing, but um, not to be mean. Sorry, lady. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's, you know, I'm, I'm being highly confusing because I'm trying to be somewhat cryptic with it, but it's, it's rife with folklore. If you're into mythology and folklore, yep. you like a fast paced thriller with some horror in it and everything. Um, definitely pick it up and leave a five-star review.
Excellent. No, I've already, I've already got it. I've already, I've already because it's on Kindle Unlimited too. So I was able mm -hmm. to jump on and grab it straight away. So um, I will be reading that this afternoon. So I'll let you know what I think. That's um, what ah, it sounds like my cup of tea. That's what we do here on Stories of True and the Fictional. We sell books to Ryan. Yeah, pretty much. Good. Expand my library. <laughs> So nice. that's really the only reason I'm doing this, not to promote authors or anything. It's just because I've got nothing to read. So I just, you know. <laughs> not really. How many times have you read Jamie's books? Um, I've read, well, he's the latest <laughs> one I've read three times. Oh, but I'm wow. not a good, I'm not a good, I'm not a good awesome. review. I'm not a good review person because I just tell him there's nothing wrong with it. It's a, it's because a, I it's believe only... that there's nothing wrong with it. And because he put me in the first book in a little bit, if I figure if I read it more, I'll be expand. The Ryan expanded universe will happen in more books. So <laughs> that's what I'm aiming for. You're going to be a recurring character. Yeah. Look, I don't want to toot my own horn or anything, but if you want to make me the Stan Lee of the Jamie Bryden universe, I'm happy to be that person. Well, nice. it, it, it is, it is a, you know, a zombie book. So Ryan, you better behave yourself because. Uh... <laughs> I reckon I always, I always say I'd be a better I'd be a better zombie than I would be a survivor because you know then I don't have to worry about running away from zombies and stuff. And, I mean, <laughs> Jamie, I don't even think you plug yourself on your Peapod. There's a Peapod page with all your links and stuff. I haven't I have I'm to avidly try to, to find your book, and I haven't yet. I I mean, granted, I I dedicated about ten minutes to the search in my incredibly chaotic life, but. I, I, I think Usually I, in ten minutes I can get it done. Yeah, I put it in the um, show notes most of the time, but so half the time I just forget because you know um, the first book I wrote got picked up by a publisher, so that's getting redone. So I'm kind of like, they're going to take care of it all. <laughs> Congratulations! Thanks, man. Um, that's amazing. It was a shock because it was a month and a half after I released it myself, and they contacted me, and I was just like, okay, sure. <laughs> wow, that's but, awesome. That did not happen to me. No, that is well, good. You know, luck of the draw. Because <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't, I don't want to say it was the character of Ryan in your book that got picked up by a publisher, but no. I'm just like it's just coincidental. I'm just no, that like, was the other other book, Ryan. Oh, okay. Fair. You're not, an, you're not an emu, mate. Spiritually, <laughs> spiritually, I am. Yeah, it's cool. Though. Yeah, no, nah, like that's well, yeah, a big the... thing. I, I'm very, very proud of him. He's, he's worked his ass off on this book, and as you authors do, you know, you put your heart and soul and everything into it, and it's I very, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing to happen. I still don't feel like it was very fair because it was the first thing I ever did. <laughs> well, that's even more fair because there yeah. was a lot of people who kept saying, um, like, you know, you shouldn't try to try to go in so hard with your first published book. But I was like, I think this has chops. Like, I've read a lot of books and I hate myself. So I'm pretty, yeah. being a pretty good, uh, you know, being a pretty unbiased judge with the self-reflection. I really <laughs> you know what I mean? And, um, but I'm recognizing, you know, like th this could be shit. And um, yeah. after, you know, I really got it revised and stuff. I was like, no, I'm really going to put this out there. Yeah. And I mean, I've received some good feedback. So I don't think you should feel that way. No, you got to have that confidence in yourself. Otherwise it's not going to work. I like, I've sold probably like a hundred books or so. I've hardly done any marketing, but no reviews, no reviews. <laughs> That's the hardest part, though. You got to lie, lie, cheat, and steal to get those reviews. And they have to be honest reviews. Like, I'm not trying to buy 10,000 yeah. fake reviews. Yeah. But I've got 37, and those that reflects probably 20 hours of labor. Yeah. Getting up to the first 20 of those. 17 of those are probably unsolicited. It sucks. Yeah. And it's that whole, it's that catch 22 self, like, yeah. you know, snake eating the tail thing. Yeah. You can't sell if you don't have reviews, but yeah. you can't get reviews if you don't sell. And now I'm like, yeah, the publisher will take care of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're, I mean, they've got a marketing team that knows their stuff. Yeah. And well, they, they, the key with indies too, though, is if you're writing a series, the best way to get people to buy your first book is to publish your second book and your third yeah. book and your fourth book. Yeah. Well, and once you start gaining steam, it snowballs. Yeah. Well, that's why, that's why I pumped out the one that runs in for five seconds. Um, <laughs> I just, you know, I wanted to get more out there. So I just, I, you know, just turned an old screenplay into a novella and I was just like, Suck it out there. Nice. I didn't Sucks. know you wrote screenplays too. Fantastic. I, I did once upon a time. Um, cool. And then I, you know, they didn't go anywhere because it, like it's impossible. It's harder to get into filmmaking than, you know, getting published essentially. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I had a good Why idea and I just turned it into a book. It was like Good stuff. And it worked out. So I'm happy. <laughs> so now if I put Ryan in one of my future books, who's going to sue me? You or Ryan? Who owns the rights to Ryan? Um, yep, you. Is I identify Keanu, as Ryan, actually? so I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. 
So I, I just, it was just, an, I tell you what, I didn't know about it. And it was just a little, like Jamie said, it's like a little 10 second thing. But when I read the book, I'm like, oh, I got a little, like, it was just, it was just a nice little feeling. Like I'm, yeah. I over-exaggerate massively and I wouldn't care if I'm not in another one at all, but it was just a nice little thing. No, because so. at least half the characters were named after real people. So Yeah. Yeah. And uh, those that are inspired by real people, I tend to change the names for and stuff. Um, at some point, I'm going to write a book about a high schooler because yeah. it's like you write what you know. Mm-hmm. And I, I know four students. Actually, they're graduating college now because I'm getting older. <laughs> and um, I, I, these personalities that stick with you for life sort of thing, you yeah. can't really use their real names unless yeah. it's your buddy, Ryan. But <laughs> I'm, all, I'm all for the same with self-promotion. Like, use me and abuse me. There you go. <laughs> but, so um, a, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, fiction I'm mirrors life. Reading. Good deal. Well, I'm looking glad forward to, hear to reading it. it. Um, and I will be reading it this afternoon. And um, I'll get Jamie. Oh, Jamie will give me the your email address and I'll shoot you an email after I've read it. But um, cool okay, feedback, you met, you by the way. Tell me how much it sucks. I but um, as I'm doing such a good job plugging the book, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, speaking but, of uh, plugging, you mentioned the yeah. second book. Um, yeah, what's the um, tell us a little bit about obviously you can't you don't want to spoil the first book but tell us a little bit about it and how it's coming along and what it's called and when when's it coming out okay so that's the toughie um it was slated to come out in may and we are not there mm-hmm. so um Next may. we're not even at yeah maybe <laughs> we're getting like it might be october again just like the first one october 2021 is when beneath the veil came out the sands of akira um will likely come out probably around that time. I'm probably going to need the summer um, to really get into it. This year has been just exhausting. So I just don't have the three nights a week. Maybe I get lucky and can get 1500 words down, but um, Akira is the word. And actually um, in the Muslim tradition for the afterlife. So, so um, there's, there's a scene change scenery change from the Northeast United States predominantly, you know, and the world in between. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it, he, David jumps the Atlantic spoiler alert, I guess David lives. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any point in time where you're worried about that. Is that because he's anyway. the protagonist, <laughs> he, you know, he's got that plot armor, but, yeah. um, but there's there, you know, there's some, there's not as much tropey stuff. Um, the, some of the things that people didn't like about how the first one ends get resolved. A lot of unanswered questions um, also unsurprisingly get flushed out in the second book. I've had some people give me some cool feedback where I'm like, you understand there's at least like 110,000 more words coming on this story. Right. So like, I'm going to touch upon those things. again. Exactly. <laughs> I, I needed to, I can't like wrap it all up in a bow after the first book and start fresh. So that's when that's going to come out, hopefully. And um, really, it's a continuation of the journey. But what happens with David is something, I mean, this is stories, the real, right? The true, rather, and the fictional. So one of the things that about my personal life that is reflected in David is um, he's got a single mom growing up. Mm -hmm. And he's got that absent absentee father thing that's part of his deal and part of his call to adventure, too. And um, I had the same thing. I didn't meet my father after I was like two, two and a half until I was 26. And I was heading, I used to work on the railroad. It's a whole thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a conference down in St. Louis and he lived there. So I gave him a call one day. I was like, Hey, let's do this. Let's meet up and have a good time. And um, boy, did we, he (laughs) he showed up, he, uh, he pulled out a flask um, like in the car while driving to the karaoke bar. So I knew it was going to be a fun night. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, and like two and a half hours later, he's got a shirt off showing me where he got like almost cut in half and the drive through of a jack in the box, which tells you everything you need to know about my dad. <laughs> he can piss you off enough to try to murder him in the time it well, takes okay. to get to a drive through yeah. window. <laughs> But he's a, he's a great guy. He's calmed down a lot in his older years and we've reconnected. I've reconnected with that whole side of my family, which is wonderful. And, um, and, uh, that's going to be kind of what you're looking into when you get into book two is that whole aspect of David and his father sort of thing, like what's going on there. And it's not even really, um, too spoilery, but, uh, you find out David's shtick essentially and why he's so interesting to some of these mythological figures like Lilith, speaking of uh, mm-hmm. Judeo-Christian myth, um, and Asmodeus and some other characters is um, because he shares blood with Azazel, 
who's Ooh. sort of the big baddie. Iblis and Azazel are the big baddies in the Muslim tradition. Um, you ever hear the term scapegoat? Yep. That's where it comes from. Um, there's actually a holiday they celebrate, and they have the two goats. You have the one that you sacrifice to the big guy upstairs, and then you have the one where you kind of place all the sins, and you send that one out to the desert for the for Azazel, who's uh, the king of the shaitan, who are the the uh, the baddies you don't want to meet when you're traversing the desert. Um, I guess you don't want to meet the jinn either, but. You know, I'd rather that than a shade. Hat. <laughs> you might get a wish out of it or two. So that's kind of what he's dealing with there. And then um, the other interesting aspect of the first book, there's a nice hospital scene. And I completely changed the tenor of it because um, August 2020, I was out there. There was a tropical storm that came through and um, knocked down a big old tree branch out here in my yard. And I went out there. I mean, I've got experience taking down trees and stuff, but I was going too fast and wasn't paying attention. Long story short, I got smushed pretty good. Um, yeah, my uh, my wife ended up getting it up the quarter inch it needed with her Hercules strength. Um, like literally gave me just enough room to get it off my chest oh, wow. and squeezed up a little bit. But um, I dislocated my collarbone at the SC joint. I had a oh. hematoma like this oh. in my neck because that stabbed my thyroid. Um, something's still wonky about the shoulder. It sounds like there's broken glass and gravel in there, but I won't <laughs> complain too much. I broke seven ribs all at the back, which was the cool, well, cool part, oh, wow. I guess. Um, you know, what's interesting about it is I guess when it was coming down, I went like, Hoo! when I saw it, <laughs> cause I was on my back, it bought me. And then I was on my back and it finished the job. And because I didn't hold my breath and like tense, all of my ribs did what they were supposed to do and they flexed oh, and they yeah. all broke at the back where they didn't have anywhere else to go. So, um, yeah, I was in the ICU, like during a COVID surge oh, at a student hospital, right after having, like, they roll me over on the trauma table and I got a bunch of 22 year olds who look like supermodels, male and female looking at my bare ass. <laughs> like, this is the best day of my life. Uh, <laughs> So I'm up there in the ICU and I'm just so thankful to be alive. Both my boys and my wife and everybody are at home worried sick about me. I'm, and um, I'm going to come home and I'm thankful for that. And when I got back, I just kind of nailed down the, uh, the scene again to kind of reflect that vibe, yeah. you know, of being oh, wow. super happy. So, yeah, I mean, it was serious, but there's no reason to, to worry. You don't have to send flowers or chocolates or anything. I'm doing okay. I'll cancel that order then. <laughs> but Dude, no, wow, man, that would have been scary. It was terrifying. Uh, yeah. it, I didn't shit myself, but it did scare okay. the shit out of me. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> well, look, that's one thing you can put down. At least you didn't have to go and have those supermodel 22-year-olds looking at you laying on your phone with shit all down your back. Yeah. <laughs> it was just so bizarre. The guy rolls me over. Like, they're trying to figure out if they're going to cut me open or not at that point. I'm pretty aware of it. And I'm also pretty aware of, like, I'm a pretty squirrely guy, but I'm not getting anywhere on that at that point. Yeah. So he rolls me over and he says, like, squeeze or something. And I'm like, you're going to have to be more specific, Junior. <laughs> what, what, what do you want me to do and there was another funny moment too the uh the people at the cat scan machine were like it was a male and a female but the best way i could describe them is kind of like oscar and felix from the odd yeah. couple yeah they were just their pitch and catch was brilliant and i guess the in the ambulance the lady put the iv in mm -hmm. and it just sort of wasn't in the vein so my arm was just filling up with saline oh, fluid God. and I looked like Popeye and she looks <laughs> at me and she goes what's going on with your forearm and i just look at the guy standing next to her and i'm like go fish what's going on with my form <laughs> sort, of sort of thing so like the, it was just funny i don't know i guess that's uh defensive humor yeah, I suppose, yeah, yeah. when you're in that environment yeah. so we just ended up i met some of the best people there it was the best experience you can have in an icu is the best way i could put yeah. it right so yeah. it that affected the book as well well it would have it's, it's oh wow that's it's absolutely insane so how long were you out how long were you did you need to take before you could get back into it? That was the best part of the story. So I was teaching summer school. We were remote. I ended yeah. up not taking a sick day because it was the Thursday. And I think we had the Friday off or something weird. Um, so I ended up teaching from my phone in the ICU for a little while. One of my good friends, Carrie, covered for me a bit. And, um, and then I only had to be there for 28 hours or so. 
because okay. the, they uh, they hematoma stopped bleeding and that mm -hmm. was what they were worried about was my airway being obstructed yeah so they were like we're yep. just gonna get this guy addicted to opioids and get him out of here because <laughs> they didn't want me there <laughs> they didn't want me there with covid right yeah so um they basically said there's this thing called an incentivizer mm -hmm. and you have to blow in it for a minute or something like that and keep it above a line and i got really good at that i just basically stayed up all night uh, hitting that thing. And, um, the chief surgeon came and he's like, so there's not many people who can do this sort of thing. The type of person that can is the one that's used to inhaling or exhaling very slowly and deliberately. And I was like, I know what you're getting at doc. <laughs> and you're going to find all that out in the blood test. I'm sure, but I I'm clean buddy. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. So I was wow. out quick. My wife ended up, she's a nurse, thank God. Oh, she wow. She ended up caring for me here. The boy is no mercy. Daniel was all yeah. over me all the time. It was brutal. Daddy time. Daddy, daddy can't teach, you know. I'm just going to be, yeah. yeah. Time to break a few more ribs. Exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So with, with the second book, sorry to go back to that. The, the reason oh, yeah, we have you on. Point of the um, show. With, with, <laughs> so with the second one, you're, you're still, you were saying you're still in the process of, of finish of writing that, correct? Yeah, because I'm extending it. Yeah. I think, um, it, Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong on this, duology, duology, duology. duology. Duolo I don't think many series have just two books, right? No. No. No, I think they're either, they're either a trilogy or they go on for about 140 years. Like <laughs> yeah, Matthew and I don't want to do stuff. that. That's like yeah. the indie romance thing, not to yeah. knock them. It's making yeah. great money for a lot of people, but it's like, I'm just not into expanding it if it doesn't need to be. Yeah. And a lot of the nuts and bolts I'm finding we're going to be in the third book have crept into the second okay. at the 65, 70,000 yeah. word mark. So I thought, why not just pump this thing up to be 110, 120 and wrap up the story? Yeah. And, um, uh, then I can get to that that um, anthology of, exactly. of kind of what was going on. Because if the demons are all running around in New York State for a few weeks, like, don't we want to kind of see what was happening exactly. at the 7-Eleven and at Grandma's house and things like that? I kind of want to explore that a little bit. So and that'll be the third look, there's, there's nothing to say that you can't go back to it. You right. know what I mean? Like, if it takes off and, and, and you feel like there's another story, another part of David's story, you, there's nothing to say that in, in five or six years or down the track that you can't just jump back on and, and keep telling that story. That's so, a good point. You know, you don't, you know, even if, even if that particular, the, those particular two books tell one story. Right. Who's to say that David, the, David has a kid down the line and then it's his hero's journey. And, you know, I, mean, I, I haven't read the books yet, but I mean, I know the hero's journey, you know, yeah. like, I've played enough Dungeons and Dragons and stuff like that to know the hero's journey. Like it's, you, you know, your character dies. I am the son of David. Come back. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I yeah, mean, that, I mean there's there. that option down the track too, but like, you, you know, it, you can tell a story, move on to some other stories to get back into the horror side of things. You never know. You might come back 10 years down the track. We'll have you on again. And if we're still, there you go. and there you go, you'd be the return. You'll be the return to the series. So do so I is that the only thing that you're working on at the moment? What's that? Another is thing that I'm working on? the only thing that you're working on at the moment? This, this second that book. and I have a few of the short stories going at the same time. Um, the, the meat and potatoes of the standalone book that's yep. going to follow is there as well. So pretty much got everything I'm going to write through 2023, I think, kind of rattled around in my head or started up on Scrivener. Because um, I'm, I'm thinking 13 short stories um, and another novel will probably take me through for a while. And then Jamie knows I'm going to probably submit those short stories to every magazine <laughs> that will accept anything. I'm really dying to get into an Ellen Datlow uh, anthology as well. She puts together some of the best horror anthologies every year. So we'll see how that goes. Well, be before we wrap it up and we plug the crap out of you, I have one question. <laughs> and that's seen as you're a fan of horror, to, 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 steal, to steal a line, what's your favorite scary movie? My favorite scare, like of all time, of all time. You can give me look. I'll, I'll I'll let you because you've been such a great guest. I'll let you give me two or three. <laughs> okay. Well, you it's know what? Really Since we talked about salties, let's go with one of the campier ones first. Yep. Um, how about Alligator, the OG Alligator movie? If you haven't seen it, I have not. 
Oh man, if you're talking, and this wasn't a B horror movie either. This sucker was on TNT like every October. Okay, it's this American it um, concept of that those gators oh, wow, that, that was flushed amazing. down the toilet. It's so good, and like the the entire camera angle for the beast cam is like in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Joe oh, Bob wow. Briggs style. So um, from from yeah. 1980, does that sound about right? Oh yeah. Yeah, it's excellent. it's oh, wow. a must watch um if you're into those reptilian horror movies yeah. um my favorites let's go with psychological for it and the thing is a psychological horror movie right mm -hmm. would yeah. you say yeah. yeah i think so yeah. that's my take so i love the thing i mean it's such a safe answer though so i'm glad you gave me a couple um <laughs> what would be what would be one of the good ones that i've seen recently that might be a little obscure uh has anybody heard of the endless no well, that's a lovecraftian one okay. yeah let's try to find the gentlemen's names because they're they're blowing up a bit um was that on, um, like in, oh, is yeah. it one? it's on prime yeah it's on prime would you say is it the time loop one yes it is time yes, loop I watched one. That. it's such it's pretty good right it was well written like yeah. i didn't like it kept me going like i was watching the whole thing um, justin justin benson and aaron moorhead and they're both in it as well. They've got another one out too. Um, Benson's, uh, I think Moorhead is actually the one who who conjured the second. Um, okay. But okay. Spring is the other one that I've seen, and that one's phenomenal too. That one's like a the guy finds this absolutely gorgeous Italian lady in Italy of all places. Can you oh, imagine? Yeah. And <laughs> you know she's more than meets the eye. Oh, she's a transformer. Uh, yeah, <laughs> she turns into, you know, it's not Megatron though, it's Starscream, but it's still a good one. Oh, the, hey, Starscream's my favorite. I, yeah, I Starscream's love good. He's, a, he's such a good number, too. Oh, yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, those are fantastic. And like that, and uh, if you watch Triangle as well, Triangle's like the endless, it's got that cool little mental, uh, sort of mental time bomb thing going. I'm and absolutely you, you loving that, you because you're giving me these movies I have not seen, and it's hard for me to find a horror movie. <laughs> that i have not seen so i think you're gonna like these three too um right. well have you seen velocipaster yet that's the yes 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 <laughs> that I, is the best movie i in didn't history. make it through it no, no it's hard we, it's the best bad movie ever <laughs> yeah oh, it had a great start um i just love at the start when he walks out of the church and 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 the his parents are supposed to die in a car explosion and it just says explosion there's no explosion <laughs> it just says the word explosion <laughs> ran out of budget yeah. oh my god and, and that the paper mache raptor seriously that was just oh man yeah those are good stuff Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can't go wrong with Carpenter. It's so hard for me because yeah. I'm such a geek for horror. Mm. Um, I mean, like, yeah, it's, it, I'm right wrapped up in stranger things right now too. And yeah. everything they're doing is like an Easter egg for King. Yeah. Well, can I and... just say one thing before you go on? I've only just discovered stranger things. I'm only at season one. So Jamie and you are like probably up to date, but no spoilers, please, because I'm really loving it. I've got one more episode, but I got a feeling my wife's pa okay. passed out, so I'll have to save that for tomorrow. <laughs> um, yeah, I won't say much. I, my students just started a D&D &D club, too, and one nice. of them has a lot of thoughts <laughs> about this season. But there's the only thing I'll say that's not going to be too spoilery for you is the uh, fourth episode of season four does such a great job of just expressing what trauma is like, I think. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah, okay. like it, it's it's art, and you don't expect to see art when you're putting on season four of Stranger Things, and it's yeah. brilliant. No, well, I'm loving it. I'm, I was saying to Jamie before you came on, the only I've watched the first episode four times mm -hmm. over the last since it came out, and the only reason I couldn't get behind it is because I really don't like Winona Ryder, and because mm -hmm. she's so prevalent in the first season. Um, I've I've never liked her. I've, she's just a whiny, whiny lady, and, and Jamie said that's what she's supposed to be in this yeah. show so i'm like that's how i'm moving past it but she's typecast yeah pretty much for sure and i mean the only movie i think i've ever liked her in was mr deeds because i'm an adam sandler fan that's um, a good one but yeah i just i just don't like it but i'm pushing through this time because jamie just jamie claims this show was made for me so <laughs> yeah 100 you know. <laughs> percent. based on what i know of you yeah 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 you're so, gonna you're gonna love it Oh no! I, but I mean, I'm my favorite genre of horror at the moment is found footage. So I'm mm -hmm. watching. I'm going back. I watched a documentary on. Have you? Uh, I don't know. Do you know Shutter? Martin oh, Shutter. Shutter. Yeah, Shutter. So we've got it out in here, Australia, finally. And um, 
I watched a documentary on the found footage phenomenon and I'm just sitting there with my phone going, okay, that's a movie, that's a movie, that's a movie. And I'm working my way through <laughs> all the found footage movies I haven't seen. Um, I like, oh, well, I mean, I, I grew up on Blair Witch, obviously Blair yeah. Witch, you know, that's the one that I'd known. And then I've been discovering all these ones on uh, Prime and on Shudder. And then mm. um, I watched this movie and I'm like, okay, all right, well, I've got, I think I've got a list of about another six to watch. Mm. Uh, one of our guests, uh, Gillian Clare, was in um, one called, I think it was called Alien Abduction. And I was like, yeah, I rented it for $1.99 on the Apple Store. I wasn't expecting it to be good. It was amazing. Nice. And, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm massively into found footage. Anything found footage I will watch regardless of how rubbish it is. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm always keen for more horror. So I've added all of those. I'm putting that in the notes, yeah. I mean, yeah. it shouldn't be hard to remember Alien Abduction. Yeah, so it's, I'm it's in on, that state I know it's of on exhaustion. Apple TV because uh, that's where I rented it for $1.99. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was actually really good. Only, I, I have this rule with every good horror movie only goes for an hour. It cannot go longer than an hour and a half. That's how I judge. I, I, I look back at all I'm the movies you. that I've watched. Hour 23. Look, I'll, I'll extend it to an hour 40 max, but they all generally go for about an hour and a half. And that's yeah. how I will go. Okay, this is going to be a good horror movie. You know, like, the, I mean, I saw Wolf Creek. That's found footage, right? Yeah. That's in the outback. I saw um, found footage. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of based on, it's based off two real life serial killers that we have out here yeah. in Australia. That's another thing we tend to import, uh, we tend to export a lot. We do get a lot of serial killers out here. Um, but yeah, that was, to tell you a little bit of a funny thing about Wolf Creek, and Jamie will be with the guy that plays the, the murderer, the serial killer in Wolf Creek, is well known in Australia for being on a gardening show. John Jarrett, his name is. He he he, but, um, he was on even, Better Homes and Gardens for about twenty years. Even better than that, he was on Play School. Oh, he's on Play School, which is a kids show, a children's you know, entertainment show. Is yeah. he like an extra with the Wiggles now too? <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know, him out. Since Wolf Creek, he hasn't got much work, but um. No, Wolf Creek. I, I, my, my housemate. Like, because we're still best friends. She wants to go to Wolf Creek in the Northern uh, Territory. And I, look, I appreciated the film and the stories and stuff, but I'm not going to be going to Wolf Creek. <laughs> why, why do you want to tickle the bear? Yeah. Um, but good. yeah, those were good. The, I think the best contemporary, well, contemporary. God, it's been ten years probably. But Sinister <laughs> with um, Ethan Hawke. Yes, yes. Was that yes. one was a big? That was a surprise. How good that was. Yeah, I we slept with the lights recently. on that night. No, yeah. I didn't. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, mean, that I one got me. I discovered that recently. Um, I, I was trolling through one of, because I'm one of those people, I have all the streaming services. So I was trolling through and I'm like, oh, okay, Sinister, Ethan Hawke. Looks pretty mm. good. Yeah, that, that creeped the shit out. <laughs> yeah, it was, that was messed up. And they had that whole demon aspect in that too that you didn't really see coming. That was cool. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I get the feeling we could sit here and talk about horror movies for probably another we'll Save it hours. for the second episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly well why don't you before we let you go martin and obviously we definitely definitely will be having you back because we've barely scratched the surface on everything we need and i think we've almost gone for two hours um, yeah. so i think you actually win you're you're the longest running interview we've had is that right jamie yep yep excellent you're in the no shortage time. of words best <laughs> Elon Musk story best longest running interview absolutely love it but why don't you just plug everything where can the listeners buy your book learn more about you, social media, everything. Um, you can call me at, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but you can go to Reed Kearns, R-E-A-D-K-E-A-R-N-S.com. And you can find the links for Amazon there. I'm going to update it soon because um, the ebook's going to be available wide as soon as I'm done with um, my Kindle Select timeframe. So you're going to be able to get it everywhere uh, through draft to digital puts it literally everywhere. Um, it's already paperbacks already available pretty much Barnes and Noble um, brick and mortar stores are coming. I just got a very positive Kirkus review, which is something of a big deal for me um, helps you get into libraries and brick and mortar. It legitimizes you. And so they oh, know wow. that they're not wasting their money entirely. I suppose <laughs> that wow. and your cover and your blurb pretty much are the holy tri trinity that you need to get into the stores. And I've got pretty good now, so cool. I'm gonna be there too. Um, but if you really want to grab it quick, grab it on Amazon. Um, Jeff Bezos is losing a lot of money out there. You gotta you gotta help him 
fuel his jets and yep. whatnot, feed his robots, whatever it is he needs. <laughs> um, but if I am focused heavily on getting it into some of these indie bookstores, brick and mortar bookstores, these people that really love the craft and yep. need that attention. So if you're going out to buy a book and you want to take a walk, get your steps in, head to your local bookstore, grab, grab a copy of my book there or ask for it, that would be even better. And they'll be like, oh, we're shits. We don't have it. We have to order a thousand copies. <laughs> and then that'll be great. Um, but yeah, that's where you'll find it. I'm going to be working on this um, series for, like we said, of another, probably another year or so with including the short stories. And then we're going to jump into, jump into a different type of story afterward, I believe. Excellent. All right. Excellent. So guys, make sure you go out and buy multiple copies of this book. Uh, check out check out uh, Martin's website for Terminal Link. Uh, it's free to download. You can read it. If you're in Australia, if you're a Kindle Unlimited subscriber, you can get the book as part of your Kindle Unlimited subscription. Um, very easy to get. It took me, I think, about 30 seconds. So it, all the links are on his website. So make sure you oh, check that out. Uh, www. Say, too, it's also available on Audible, narrated by the extremely talented Nathaniel Priestley. Excellent. Um, if you have some coins laying around, use them. Yeah, and excellent. No, and that, Dan, thank you so much for taking the time to come and have an extended chat with us today. We, I really feel like it's only been 10 minutes, but I can't believe it's almost been two hours. <laughs> the only way I know it's been two hours is I can see Jamie's eyelids slowly <laughs> getting lower. <laughs> there it is. Oh, uh, excellent. So, Tony, do you want to wrap everything up? Because I think you've oh, still got oh, about I'm allowed to speak words. again now? You've got 150 words left. So. <laughs> Yeah, between me and Ryan, I feel bad. <laughs> no, it's, it's what happens. I'm, I'm like the mediator. Um, <laughs> thanks for coming on, guys. You know the deal. Like, subscribe, share. Leave us a review because the only one we've got on there is someone from Bangladesh for some reason. Who called, I didn't who, even know about that one, so yeah. Which platform, though, is the only one that's from Bangladesh? Because no, I uh, went on... Um, iTunes. I listen on Spotify. Okay, so iTunes is the only one I think you can leave a review. Yeah. I think Spotify, you just listen, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. The, the, the review said, very nice. You you are wonderful, oh. Ryan and Bryden. They didn't even say my name. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> they got my name right. So that's amazing. And it says J-A too. So it took me a while to connect the fact that you, J-A, are in fact the Jamie who is yes. slipping into my DMs. Yes. <laughs> that, that, well, that, is that, cool. that, that harkens back to our, when we, me and Jamie with a couple other friends used to do a D and d role-playing podcast and we used to get thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of downloads no feedback no reviews <laughs> oh we got reviews but they never said anything it was just all five star or one uh, or whatever the star was but they never we all we pleaded for feedback we just like <laughs> give us feedback give us feedback no one ever did but i think we ended up with like a lot of downloads didn't we jamie i think we had like ten thousand downloads in a year or two yeah, and okay. no one ever said anything about it. So, <laughs> that sucks. yeah, and our Sounds Facebook page is our Facebook page is still getting likes. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, there you go. <laughs> we're not we're even marry active. them together. Connect we're them. Even, we're not even active anymore. <laughs> like, exactly. Do you know oh, what you're well. liking? It's um, <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Anyway, everyone say goodbye, and I'm gonna press stop. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening for an exceptionally long period of time. (laughs) Take care, you two. This was awesome. See you next time, guys. Hello listeners and watchers. Jamie here. I just wanted to take a second to let you know that I too am an author. And I have two books of my own. One, Letters from the Emu War. Based on a real-life event, it tells the story of the time when the Australian Army declared war on 20,000 flightless birds and lost. This book is written from the perspective of those who won. And two, Bucks Night. First in a trilogy of novellas, it's about a medieval-themed Bucks party that is interrupted by the zombie apocalypse. You can find them both on Amazon by following the links in the show notes.